My dear young brothers and sisters in Islam, in today's first half of the khutbah, I want to explain to you a surah that each and every one of you has memorized. It is perhaps your first surah that you have memorized in the Quran. It is Surah Al-Ikhlas. Surah Al-Ikhlas. That short surah that is a surah that perhaps your mother or father taught it to you, the very first surah. And you and I, we both love this surah because it is so short and sweet. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do you know what he said, even though it is one of the shortest surah in the Quran? And by Surah Al-Ikhlas, I mean, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُلَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفْوًا أَحَدْ This is called Surah Al-Ikhlas. Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do you know what he said about this surah? He said, I swear by Allah, this surah is equal to one-third of the Qur'an. إِنَّهَا لَتَعْدِلُ ثُلُثَ الْقُرْآنِ Now what does it mean it equals one-third of the Qur'an? It doesn't mean that if you just recite this surah three times, you don't need the rest of the Qur'an. No, it means in blessings, in reward, it is equal to one-third of the Qur'an. Obviously in meaning, every ayah has a beautiful meaning that no other ayah has. And no one ayah can substitute for another. But in blessings, Surah Al-Ikhlas, this small surah, it will give you the blessings of one third of the Qur'an. And this is because our scholars say the Qur'an is divided into three primary areas or contents. One third of the Qur'an deals with Allah and His names and attributes. Who is Allah? And that is summarized in Surah Al-Ikhlas. One third of the Qur'an deals with the laws, the halal, the haram, eating and drinking, prayer, zakah, Ramadan. That's one third of the Qur'an. And then one third of the Qur'an it deals with heaven and hell and the stories of the prophets. And therefore, one third is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One third is the laws. And one third is the qasas of the past and the future, which is heaven and hell and the, the stories of the previous prophets. So Surah Al-Ikhlas, it substitutes for one third of the meaning of the Qur'an. And this beautiful surah was revealed very early on in Mecca. When one of the leaders of the other tribes, he heard that our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had a new religion. And so he went to him and he said, O oh Muhammad Sallallahu which God are you calling to? What is this new religion? So our Prophet Sallallahu said, Allah. So this Bedouin, he didn't know any better. He said, describe this God to me. Is he made out of gold or silver? Or is he made out of copper or wood? Which God is this? Because these people, they worshipped, what did they worship? Idols. And these idols, they would carve them with their own hands. And they would make images. Describe this God to me. Is he like a falcon with the head of a lion and the body of a this? What is this God that you're worshipping? So his mind, this Bedouin uh, tribesman, he cannot understand a God that you do not carve. An idol that you do not make out of wood, make out of uh, iron, make out of gold. So he said, what is he made of? Who is his father? Because they would have gods that have lineages. And if you study any mythical religion, the Romans, the, the, the ancient Greeks, the, the, the Hindu religions, they have a whole family of gods. This god married that god, they had this child. This is in their culture. So the man is saying, what is his nasab? Where is his lineage? Where does this god come from? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in response to this question, Surah Al-Ikhlas. He revealed Surah Al-Ikhlas. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفْوًا أَحَدْ I will talk about this surah in the first half of the khutbah. Now one of the beautiful points before we move on is that my dear brothers and sisters, it is the wisdom of Allah that He has chosen really two surahs of the Qur'an and uh, two surahs of the Qur'an especially that have become the most popular amongst all Muslims around the world. And these two surahs are the ones that even us young children, when we start memorizing the Quran, our parents teach these two surahs to us before any other surah. And even as we grow up, most of us stick to these surahs even as adults. And these are Surah Al-Kawthar and Surah Al-Ikhlas. And it is hardly possible that a day goes by except that, mashallah, tabarakallah, the bulk of our salah, is consisting of Ikhlas and Kawthar after Fatiha. And if you look at the content of these Turas, and it is not a coincidence, 
that Allah has written for these surahs acceptance. Yes, it is true, perhaps we love them for the wrong reason that it's so small, but even in this there's blessings. That Allah knows that most of the Muslims are not going to recite Baqarah in their salah. And so Allah chose a surah, two surahs, that complement one another. And today's khutbah is only about one of them. Inshallah, another khutbah I'll give about the other one. And these two surahs, as we said, are kawthar and ikhlas. Now, surah al-kawthar, inna a'tinaka al-kawthar, fasalli li rabbika wa anhara inna sha'anika huwa al-abtar. This surah is defending the honor of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And ikhlas is defending the honor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ikhlas and kawthar put together are our religion. La ilaha illallah Muhammad rasulullah. Surah Al-Ikhlas is all about the perfection of Allah. Surah Al-Kawthar is all about the perfection of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And these two surahs are the most beloved surahs to young and old, to man and women, to practicing and not practicing. Everybody knows, everybody memorizes, everybody loves these surahs. And even in this, there's wisdom from up there. That Ikhlas and Kawthar complement one another. Also, my dear brothers and sisters, do you know that Surah Al-Ikhlas was the surah that our Prophet ﷺ read as soon as he woke up. And it is the last surah he read before going to sleep. How so? Because what is the first prayer that you pray as soon as a practicing good Muslim, he wakes up, he's supposed to pray the Fajr prayer. But before the Fard of the Fajr, there's two Sunnahs of the Fajr. Right? And what did our Prophet ﷺ make it a habit to pray in the two Sunnahs of Fajr? Surah Al-Ikhlas and Surah Al-Kafirun. As soon as he woke up for Salat al-Fajr, you have two rak'ahs you have to pray. He made it our sunnah and to this day this is the sunnah. That the Muslim wakes up, he does wudu and he prays two rak'ahs, sunnah al-Fajr. What does he pray in those two rak'ahs? Surah al-Kafirun, Surah al-Ikhlas. And then the very last prayer of the night is the witr salah. And our Prophet ﷺ would recite Surah al-Ikhlas in the witr salah. So it is as if ikhlas begins the day and ikhlas ends the day. Not only this, our Prophet ﷺ would recite ikhlas whenever he would do the tawaf around the Kaaba, which is the greatest act of worship, demonstrating the beauty, the perfection of Allah. And after he would do the tawaf, he would pray two rak'ah. And in those two rak'ah, once again, ikhlas and kafirun. So Surah Al-Ikhlas is a surah that our Prophet ﷺ recited many times. And he made it a sunnah to recite to us day in and day out. Literally day in and day out. And the meanings of this surah are very deep and profound. And wallahi, we can give hours and hours of lectures about just Surah Al-Ikhlas, but we only have 15 minutes. So let us summarize what are some of the elements of this surah that me and you, we can understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the surah by saying, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. And the Qul is a command to preach and speak. It is as if, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that it is our duty to tell others who is Allah. It is our job. We have to tell the people who is Allah. Because the man came and he asked the Prophet describe your Lord to me. And so Allah is saying, you all collectively, your job is to spread this message. Your job is to tell people who is Allah. Qul, you answer him back. Hu Allahu ahad. And the huwa here, a little bit of advanced, my dear brothers and sisters, a little bit of grammar here for the advanced students of Arabic. This is called Damir al-Sha'an, which means it is a pronoun of respect. And to give you an English example so that you understand. Suppose, suppose somebody asks you and you're looking at the president in a large gathering. There are many people and there's the president. Somebody doesn't know, he says, which one is the president? So you say, that man, that one over there is the president. Now you don't need to say that one over there. You just say that man is the president. But you want to emphasize that man, that one over there, that is the president. This concept is what the huwa here represent. It is an honor. And of course, walillahi al-mathar al to Allah belongs the greatest honor. I'm not comparing Allah to anyone. But in our society, the most respected man will be a leader. So we will emphasize that. So the Quran, there's something called damir al-sha'an, which means there's an emphasis. Allah is above us. Allah is not like us. This huwa here, it makes Allah at a different level than us. Huwa, he's not like us. He does. You don't need the huwa here. But by adding the huwa, it's like saying that man, that one over there. You're making an extra emphasis for honor. So who Allahu Ahad. He is Allah Al-Ahad. Now, this surah 
One of the beautiful things about it, it has two names that no other surah in the Quran has. It is one of the smallest surahs in the Quran and yet it has uniqueness that no other surah has. Two names are never repeated anywhere in the Quran. Al-Ahad and Al-Samad. You're not going to find any other verse that has these two names. Any other verse. And the both of them are unique to Surah Al-Ikhlas. Now, all of you who are learning basic Arabic, you begin when you learn your numbers, you say, Wahid ithnain thalatha. Wahid. You don't say Ahad ithnain thalatha. You say Wahid. And yes, one of the names of Allah is Al Wahid. But here Allah is saying Ahad. What is the difference between Wahid and Ahad, even though they both have the same root? You see, Wahid means the first or the one who could be out of many. So you can say, One of us is Wahid. But. And so, for example, if, some, if there's a lot of people and one of them won the race, you will say, this Wahid over here, he's Wahid in the race. There are 10 people who participated. Who is number one? He's Wahid. He's the one who won the race. But Al-Ahad means there was nobody else in the race to begin with. There's no competition. Al-Ahad means he's unique. Wahid, he's one, and it could be there are others. So we say Wahid when we're talking about numbers. There's one book, Wahid, one person, Wahid. Because there's millions of books, you want to just say this one one, this Wahid. But Ahad means there's nothing like him. There's nobody else in the same category. So Allah is Ahad because there's nothing like him. And this is why we all know, for example, when that famous companion Bilal was being persecuted and tortured by the people of Mecca and he was being told to worship the false idols what was he saying ahadun ahad ahadun ahad and in the battle of uhud what was the cry of the muslims ahadun ahad ahadun ahad that we don't believe in these other gods because these gods are like us they have heads of lions and bodies of tigers and 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 hands like men they're similar to us but allah is not like us allah is ahad Say he is Allah, unique, nothing like him. The man was saying, what is he made of? The man was saying, what is his lineage? No, Allahu Ahad. He is absolutely unique, dissimilar to anything else. Allahu Samad. And this is a complete separate sentence. And Allah Azza wa could have used the pronoun by saying, who was Samad? Allah could have said, Who was Samad? But He mentioned His name again to make a complete independent sentence. Allah is also a Samad. And what does a Samad mean? A Samad is one of the most comprehensive names of Allah. Over 20 opinions what it means, but it all goes back to two meanings. It all goes back to two meanings, and both of these meanings are also complementary. The first meaning, a Samad means the one who is perfect in Himself. The one who has reached the perfection, the kamal, in every single aspect. And the second meaning of as-samad, الذي يصمد إليه الأشياء, the ones, المخلوقات, the ones whom the creation turns to. Every creation turns to him, that is as-samad. And the two meanings are complementary because only because Allah is perfect, the first meaning, will the creation that is imperfect turn to him. And that is the second meaning. So the samad, really what it means is, the one whom everything must turn to for every need of theirs. This is what the Samad means. If you're hungry, Allah must give you food or else you will never get it. If you're sick, a Samad must cure you or else you will never be cured. If you need anything, you need air to breathe, a Samad, you have to turn to a Samad. And if Samad does not give it to you, then you're not going to get it. So the Samad is the one whom you turn to. Every creation turns to a Samad for every need. This is a Samad. Now, notice here, Al-Ahad affirms the perfection of Allah in Himself. A Samad affirms the perfection of Allah in a relationship with the creation. Allah is perfect in Himself and the creation is in need of Him. Al-Ahad, a Samad are complementary names similar to Al-Hay Al-Qayyum. Al-Ahad, Al-Samad, the two combinations are similar to one another just like Al-Hay, Al-Qayyum are also complementary and similar. Al-Hay, the one who, who's ever living. Al-Qayyum, the one who provides others what they need. Similarly, Al-Ahad, the one who's unique in himself. Al-Samad, the one who provides others what they need. Qul huwa Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad. Allah is Al-Samad. 
He doesn't need anything, everything needs him. This is what a summit also can translate into English. He does not need anything, and everything needs him for everything. This is a summit. And it is one of the most unique names of Allah, and it is the only time it is mentioned in the Quran. Allahus Samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. This man said to the Prophet, ﷺ, What is the lineage of your new God? What is the lineage of this God that you're calling to? Because they would say, This God is the daughter of Allah, this God is this, this God is that. And Allah is saying, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Because Allah is Ahad, because Allah is Samad, both of the meanings necessitate. That Allah Azza wa Jal, subhanahu wa ta'ala, neither has a child, lam yalid, wa lam yulad, nor did somebody else, astaghfirullah, be his father. Allah is unique in this regard. And this is a refutation of every single belief system that ascribes sons or, or daughters to Allah. And there are many belief systems in the world that do this. That they say God has children, or God has a son, or God has a daughter. The ancient Arabs will say there are, that God has many daughters. Christianity says God has a son. Hindus and ancient Greeks, they would also say that, that gods have many daughters and many sons. And Allah is saying, Lam yalid. And he negates children. Yalid could mean boy or girl. He doesn't have any children. Walam yulad, nor did any being give birth to him. And walam yakullahu kufu an ahad. There is nothing that is similar to him. Now, once again, a little bit of advanced Arabic for those who understand Arabic that if this were other than the Quran, the more common way of saying this would be walam yakun kufu, walam yakun ahadun kufu an lahu. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ أَحَدٌ كُفُوًا لَهُ The Mubtada Khabar would come in that order. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لَهُ before to emphasize His great sha'an, His great status. That by emphasizing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is negating any similarity. Kufu means equal. Kufu means similar. And Allah is saying, and there is nothing absolutely that even remotely re resembles Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever you can imagine, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah is above that. You cannot imagine Allah because there's nothing similar to Allah. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ My dear brothers and sisters, this small surah, despite its size, it summarizes for us our relationship with Allah. It summarizes for us what we believe about Allah. It summarizes what makes Islam different from every other religion in this world. What is our unique selling point, my dear brothers and sisters? What makes us different? It's our concept of our God. If you look at any other religion, they have a different concept of God. And we don't agree with that concept. We say Allah is unique, nothing like Him. We say Allah Azza wa Jal is a Samad. He doesn't need anything. Everybody needs Him. And we say He doesn't have children, nor is He begotten. And there is nothing like unto Him. This beautiful summary of our Lord is why Surah Al-Ikhlas is so beautiful. And we conclude the first khutbah by mentioning one of the most sweetest ahadith about Surah Al-Ikhlas. And it is a hadith in which a companion of our Prophet Sallallahu he would lead the prayer. And every time he would lead the prayer, he would recite Surah Al-Ikhlas. He would recite Fatiha and then Ikhlas. And then he would move on to another surah. Until somebody in the audience got irritated. This was another masjid in the lifetime of the process, a faraway masjid outside of Medina. So another companion got irritated. He said, why do you always recite Ikhlas in every single rak'ah? The man felt, didn't want to answer. He said, I'm not going to answer you, but this is my habit. I'm going to recite Ikhlas. Somebody else complained. And he said, look, if you want another imam, that's fine. But I will always recite ikhlas in every rak'ah. That's my methodology, my style. Eventually, a third man complained to the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. He went to him in Medina. He said, Ya Rasulullah, our imam that has been appointed, in every single rak'ah after Fatiha, he recites ikhlas, then he moves on to a longer surah. Not that if he only recited ikhlas. He moves on to a longer surah. So now the Prophet ﷺ said, tell him I am asking him, why is he doing that? He can't say no to the Prophet ﷺ. Go tell him I am asking him, why is he doing that? So they went and they said, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ is asking you, why do you recite Surah Al-Ikhlas? Now he cannot get out of it. So he says, because Ikhlas, Surah Al-Ikhlas describes my Lord. And I love to read his descriptions. 
Because Surah Al-Ikhlas describes my Lord and I love to read his descriptions. When they went back and they told the Prophet ﷺ his response, he said, go back and tell the man that his love for Surah Al-Ikhlas has caused him to enter Jannah. Now my dear brothers and sisters, we also love Surah Al-Ikhlas. But let us make our love for Surah Al-Ikhlas not just because it is a small surah, but because it is a surah that describes Allah. And it is a surah that complements Surah Al-Kawthar. And it is a surah that tells us the uniqueness and the perfect nature of our Lord. It is sunnah to love Surah Al-Ikhlas, but we should love it because it describes our Lord. Barakallahu wa rakum fi Qur'an azim. Wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bima fihim al-ayati wa dhikr al-hakim. Aqulu ma tasma'un wa astaghfirullah azim alibu alakum wa salimu sabiqu wa dhamin fi astaghfiruhu innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim.